Happy New Year. I want to welcome you and I'm so glad that you're joining with me today and I have some wonderful things I'm excited to be able to share with you about. I'm going to be talking with you in this new series on New Year, New You, New Me. And I'm hoping that you will join me on this, um, in this series to be able to say, thank you, Jesus. We are in 2021. And so as I reflect on the new year, I'm reminded that the choices that I make today impact my tomorrow. And even what we're doing today is impacted by what we chose to do yesterday. You see, God has given us a free will and to make choices in uh, what we're going to do with our lives. And it's my desire that you take that, take this life that he has given to you and begin to, I don't know, see it realized to its greatest potential and to be able to say, okay, God, I'm yours. Um, this year, ha past year has been really different and it's forced us to make some changes. This virus has hit um, many lives it's hit our family, my daughter, who is just recovering it. I thank you for your prayers on that. Now my son has the virus and trying to recover. And my daughter-in-law, Christine, is ready to have her baby. She's due in about 10 days. And so sometimes they're not always that easy. And so this virus not only has hit our health, it's hit our jobs, how we do things. Uh, it has hit our finances. It hit, hits how we spend our time. And so I want us to be able to make the best use of our time and not use any excuses for what God has in store for us. Um, so I want us to be willing to face the decisions that we are making and just really become willing to make some new changes in our lives. And what does this 2021 uh, look like? What does God want it to look like for us? Because you see, if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to get the same results. And in this case, even in the church, if we kept doing what we'd done, we'd lose what we had and we would not have the connections that we have. Um, so we don't want to miss opportunities of seeing what God has around the corner. And we want to be continually growing and changing and uh, becoming all that God wants us to be. The verse that comes to my mind is Psalm 65, 11. It's a verse that kind of, I don't know, it helps me to reflect back on this past year. Um, you crown the year with a bountiful harvest. Some might say, how can you say that? We lost loved ones. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. I see God in this past year with new prayer groups that he's started in our church, stronger participation in our Bible study groups. We've move from one service to two, um, going outside services, and then sometimes indoors when we were allowed, and, and then uh, streaming our services when it became difficult for that. Um, we've made some connections through social media. I have wonderful, wonderful people in our church who have been willing to try new things. And so God has really helped us in many ways uh, to see the bountiful harvest uh, and to see the great things that he's doing in helping us make these changes and help them to become a reality. And so I just wanna thank our church family for using their gifts to make a difference. And as I reflect on the new year, I'm truly reminded that it's important for us to think ahead uh, I, that's the kind of person I am uh, as I journal. I'm trying to figure out what God's trying to say to me in pre preparation for the tomorrow. We can't control the tomorrow, but we can say, Lord, prepare me for it. And so um, when I, each year, I usually set goals. And uh, setting goals for the new year hasn't always brought about the success that they're great but I wasn't successful in meeting some of those goals. So as I was evaluating this past year, I realized that I wanted to get down to my goal weight uh, in health and trying to be healthy. When I found out this virus was hitting, I began to make some changes to be healthier, but I didn't reach that. And some people will say, well, you made some changes, right? I had a goal to read through the Bible and I only read halfway through. I admit that. 
I, I say that to you and because I would go off and I'd have questions about one thing and I'd be searching it out and I'm not one to just say, okay, I read it for the reading's sake. I'm really here to try to um, search the scriptures and find out what it's saying to me and not to say that that's not a good habit and I will work on finishing out the year. But what did work was that I began to evaluate how I prepare for 2021. It's, it's not always the goals that we set um, that is our focus. In fact, it's the process that we go through uh, to see those goals become a reality in our lives. So instead of fixing on the goals, let's fix on not just the systems or the principles or the habits that we're going to create to get to that goal, but I want to focus today on focusing on what you value. It starts there, what you value, because what we begin to value will permeate out of our lives. And I want these goals and these habits that we make into the new year to flow out of what we value, who we value, and it becomes a part of who we truly are. So before you set goals and a strategy of plans, if you're that type of person, of habits and accomplishing that goal, I want you to first identify five areas in your life that you value. Now, we're all different. And um, some of you might say family, some of you might say your job, some of you are retired and you're gonna say retirement. Uh, some of you might say joy, I will do, do anything to just get joy. I want security in life and so I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that I'm secure. Some of you might say health is, some might say Jesus Christ is, friends are. You define what those five areas that you value and what does that look like for you? Now, see, I've heard uh, different people say, I'm sorry, I can't afford to travel and go see you. And uh, that can be very painful. But what's really painful is when you find out and you go back to their home to visit them and you see that they went out and they bought that new piece of furniture or they got that new car or they got that new motor home and you're like, and you couldn't come and afford to see us and that was your reasoning. So sometimes we can be deceived in ourselves and we say, this is what I value, but our actions are really not aligning up to what we say we value. And so in this series that we're going to talk about, I'm wanting us to pray and seek God and say, no more excuses. I don't want to be deceived about myself because who do we deceive? <laughs> who deceives us more than ourselves? You know, we can be blind to how we act. I have said things. I have done things that um, I regret and I have said things that were not consistent to what I was saying I valued. So I want us to look um, as we are on this journey and of course Jesus Christ is one, is the one whom I value. And so I, I as I begin to say Jesus I value you, I have to look and say, who is this Jesus that I value? And so I'm gonna remind you today, I want us to look at this passage of scripture. If you have your Bibles, I want you to take the time, get it out with me, and let's look at John 1, 1. And we're gonna look at a few verses in this chapter. And as we do, I just wanna remind you that John is one of the gospels, one of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as we look at this book, we are going to see that John has it woven all through this book about who he is trying to say Jesus is. And he is trying to identify to us and share with us that he is God in flesh. And so he starts it off um, in uh, John saying, in the beginning the word already existed the word was with god and the word was god now who is this jesus 
who is this Jesus? When you see that word, word, in the beginning, the word, replace that with Jesus, and that will help you identify what John is trying to say. He's not taking you to the beginning of the birth, the physical birth of Jesus. Matthew and Luke talk about that when Jesus was born a baby. We just celebrated that at Christmas time, his birth, his physical birth. But John takes us all the way back to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. And so John is referencing all the way back to the Old Testament because you see the Old Testament all points to who this Jesus is. The New Testament identifies who he is and how he is the one that the Old Testament was prophesying about. And so John's saying, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word Jesus was with God and the word Jesus was God. So when we look at who this Jesus is and we become a Christ follower, we want to look at who he is and we want to decide, is he of great value to us? Because there's some marked habits and behaviors and disciplines that we will have in our life that will show not only to ourselves, we will be true to ourselves, but it will show to others who are behind us. It leads, uh, leaves a legacy to our children and to those who are after us. I can, I can remember I had a hard time uh, seeing myself as a mother until after I began to practice those things that a mother would do. I helped them. I bathed them when they were young, I fed them, I washed their clothes, I took care of them, I loved on them, I read to them, I embraced them, I loved my children, and I still do. And so over time, I was being able to identify with being a mother. And when we become identified with being a Christ follower, we begin to realize what that looks like, and we begin to live that out. Same was true when I was a pastor. What did a pastor look like? I didn't look like the pastors I thought of. Didn't feel like a pastor, but when I asked the question, even as a high schooler, because God was calling me in those days, and I began to say, I have a bad attitude. I'm not being <laughs> very nice over here. And this question kept surfacing in my mind, and it would say, is that what a pastor would do? And I would be going back to Jesus and the Lord, and I would pray, and I'd say, God, that's not what a pastor should act like. Please help me, guide me, forgive me. And that's what it is as we begin to evaluate what we value, and we begin to see that our value system is not matching up with our behavior, then we can easily just say, okay, Lord, forgive me. I see it. Let's move forward. And so in the begin beginning, God, Jesus already existed. The word Jesus was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning. Who, he, who is he? <laughs> he is Jesus existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. Him referencing the word, referencing Jesus. And nothing was created except through him. Do you believe that today? Verse 4 says, the word Jesus gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. He came into the very world he created. Who came into the world he created? Jesus. But the world did not recognize him. Verse 11, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. You see, Jesus is now not seen as divine by the people. But Jesus, John is trying to say, is divine. He is God who came to this earth in human form. Verse um, 12, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, in the Gospels, Jesus would ask different people. It was very important to him. Who do the people say that I am, he said. Peter, who do you say that I am? And the question holds today, who do we say this Jesus is? 
this one that we believe in, this one that we are saying is of great value to us. You see, the Muslims see Jesus as a great prophet, but that's not what I'm talking about. The Mormons see Jesus as an exalted man who just was able to live this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful life, I guess. Jehovah Witnesses believe Jesus is created by God and not equal to God. But you see, Christianity, Christ followers, see Jesus as God in flesh, coming to earth in human form. Who do you see Jesus to be? You know, in um, 1 Corinthians, talks about uh, they are reborn not with a, uh, or John 1.13 says, they are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. And I just want to go back to 12, but to all who believed him and accepted him, we're talking the Jesus who is the divine the God in flesh. We become children of God. They are reborn, not a physical birth. When our belief system, not just I believe about Jesus, but our belief system in who he is, what he came to do, comes to transform our lives. This is not a rebirth in physical, but it is something that is supernatural and it comes from God. It's kind of like with Nicodemus saying we must be born again. We're born again and our eyes begin to see new things. Verse 14 really brings this home, this idea that Jesus is God. So the word became human and made his home among us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. When we come to know Jesus, at one time we thought of Christ also merely as a human, in a human point of view. How differently, I love the New Living Translation that says, how differently we know him now. This Jesus is more than just someone who came as a human. No, we see him differently now. He is divine. He is God with us. At verse 17, it says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Is this your year to say new year, new life in Christ? But all of it comes down to the question, who or what do you value in life? When we value Jesus Christ above all things, when we value Jesus Christ as our God above all things, it is placing God as number one in our lives. And everything else of who we become and, and what we do with our life flows from that main one decision. I can't help it. It's what I have chosen to value. You see, if I value health, my life, my health, I will make decisions in my life to keep that health as strong as I can, and it'll show. Not because I say I value health, not because I have the right gym equipment in my home, not because of anything, but it will show by the practices and the habits that I make in my life. Same is true of Jesus. When we value Jesus as our God and our Savior, it will be, you just can't separate it. We become attracted to the word of God. We begin to commune with him and it begins to make a change in what we value in this life. It changes who we are, our prayer time, our Bible reading time. When we begin to say we value Jesus. So, I can look at a goal and I can say, here I have this goal that I want to get closer to Jesus. I can make these uh, habits of reading the Bible every day and praying every day. But until we get to the very heart and core of it, of who we are, and we're saying, I identify myself as a Christ follower, it truly makes a difference in the outflow of all of my habits. You see, what do you value? What choices are you making? 
that show you are aligning your life with who you want to be and what you truly value. Your decisions, your habits that you create impact your life for tomorrow and they impact those around you. You are leaving a legacy. What are you leaving? And what do you value? And is it in alignment with what you say and think you want to value? You see, I'm so glad that my father changed his life and left a legacy behind to us as children. Came from an alcoholic family, abusive. Family members of his were beaten and some more than his life. But he chose to say, no, I'm not going to drink alcohol anymore, and I'm going to raise my children in the ways of Jesus. And by doing and having these disciplines and these habits, it has directly affected my life. Your parents directly affect your life, even by the very decision that they make to say, I will have this child that is within me. We affect those who are around us, and they are looking at our lives to say, what does a Christian look like? Do you value Jesus as the Son of God? You know, you can embrace uh, the principles in the Bible. You can pick and choose what you like and what you think you're going to live by, or you can try harder to live by it. You, you're going to benefit from this type of life. Maybe you're strongly disciplined and, and you can easily be so good at, at doing all these things and living by these principles that are laid out in the Word of God, but you will miss eternal life with God. You will miss the relationship God wants to have with you in this life. You will miss the very attributes and the character, the fulfillment that He brings, the, the power that He provides for his believers. You will miss out on the peace in the midst of the storm and the uncertainty of life. You will miss out on what it truly feels like to be forgiven by the God who created you. And he removes the shame from the wrong we have done. Oh, friends, we want to value Jesus Christ and truly live out what we value. So, are you identifying yourself as a Christ follower of Jesus? Wow. You see, it, it makes a difference in how we see ourselves because it makes those habits stronger. For example, you don't go to church or you do go to church. You're going to church and you're trying to go to church because now you're a follower of Jesus Christ and Scripture tells us to don't forsake the assembling of yourself with others, and you're saying this is hard in this pandemic, and so many of you are connecting in other ways and watching online, and it looks different, and we're all saying we understand. But the first person might say, I'm trying to put God first. And somebody comes in their path and says, oh, come on, let's go over here and let's do these activities. This sounds more important. This, this sounds a really fun to do, and... The first person says, hmm, well, I'm really trying to be a Christian now, and so I really think that I need to be at church, but thanks anyway, and they go to church. The second person's response might look like this. I'm a Christian, and I go to church. I identify myself with Christ, is what they're saying, and I make it a priority in my life. This is who I am. A person who um, works out hard and, and is trying to um, do that marathon and they're trying to be healthy and they view themselves as athletic. A person who practices the piano and works on the music as identifying themselves as some sort of musician ready to be uh, using their gifts and their talents in the area of music. A Christ follower isn't saying, well, I'm just really trying hard. I, this is who I am now. I am no longer the same as the other person. I am crucified with Christ. I am with him. I identify with him. He is valuable to me. Same is true if you have a relationship with your family or in your marriage, and the first person might say, well, I'm trying to put my family first, but the excuses are holding me back. I'm 
staying later at my job or I'm not doing um, what I said I would do and I've made promises to my kids and I'm not there. And, and so they draw on these other things and they seem to pull at them and pull at them because what they're doing is they're saying, which do you value more? The job, those other activities more than your family? Or like I said earlier, I really would like to be with you during the holidays, but I don't really have the money to go to be with you. Now, I'm not talking COVID time. I'm talking other times when we're able to be with them. And so we use money as an excuse, but later we only find ourselves spending that money on something else. Been there. And really, what are we saying we value is seen by our behavior. The second person may reply to that ploy of trying to stay at the job longer than they really have to or not being there for their child's uh, presentation at school. Second person might say, I love my family. I'm going to be with them. I'm sorry. I'm saving this time for them. I'm going to be there because I value my family. We as Christ followers, have a choice to say, what do we value? Look at who you value, what you value. And as you identify five different areas, then begin to allow the Lord to help you make habits and practices in your life that will help you to live out who you really are so that the pull of other things will become less and less. I love that old saying, what would Jesus do? Let's not live deceived lives about who we really are and how we live. Let's really be Christ followers, for he is divine. He is wonderful, and he has great source of help to encourage. Hang out with those who do. Hang out. Hang out with the Word of God. Hang out with Jesus in prayer. And may this year of 2021 be one where we become stronger in our walk with our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is my all. I value him, number one. I'm looking forward to again meeting with you next week, and I pray that you will join us. I'm going to be talking about some other areas of new life, new you, new me. And I want you to be challenged. I want you to grow in this as you take time alone with God to find out what you truly value. Come back or share in the comments below and tell us what you, maybe where you failed, that you just feel like I need to share this. I've shared my heart. Or share what it is that God's wanting to do in your life. If you've given him your life today and believed him, for salvation, then share with us below. Let me pray with you today. Lord Jesus, this is a new year, and uh, we are thankful that you have given us this life to live. And we praise you, Jesus, that we know you. We, Like um, uh, Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians, there, there was just this thinking that we thought of you, Jesus, as just another human being, but we know the truth, and the truth is that, Jesus, you are divine, and there is power in the name of Jesus. And so we want to tap into you, into our relationship with you, and grow this year in our walk with you. Strengthen the church today, Lord Jesus. Strengthen our lives and our walk with you so that we'll hear you more clearly. We will just be directed by you. We will be empowered by the Holy Spirit that you have given to us. And we thank you today for all that you want to do in our lives. And we look forward to 2021 because you are our value. You are our everything. Thank you, Jesus, for our time today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.